I knew that I was representing more than just myself when I started Fifth Avenue School, more than just my family even. I, I think my parents did an excellent job of protecting me and yet preparing me for being the first black child to integrate the schools in the state. My name is Sonny Wellington Herford IV. I'm a soft, software and systems engineer. I work out on the arsenal. I do on a DOD contract. Starting Fifth Avenue was certainly unusual because I was the only black child there. And that was interesting, although I'm grateful that I started in first grade and not high school, for example, because first graders, for the most part, don't know that you're not supposed to like people who are, or dislike people who are different than you are, you know? So I got along with most of the kids very well. There were a few exceptions, but for the most part, we were just children and, you know, we enjoyed recess and lunch and running and playing and, and I enjoyed the academic part of it as well. One incident that happened in the lunchroom one time in first grade, there was a young lady who wasn't tall enough to get her tray down off the stack of trays in the cafeteria. And I got her tray and I went to hand it to her. And she said, oh no, my mother told me never to take anything from a nigger, just like that. And so, and, uh, which could have been a very negative incident in my life. But even at six years old, I understood that she didn't even understand what she was saying. She was parroting what her mother had told her. And so that, even over all these years, that has given me hope that children that young were not born with prejudices and bigotry. And unfortunately, some children get taught that by their parents or by older brothers or sisters or friends or whatever. But uh, I've always uh, taken heart from that. Like I said, even at six, I recognized uh, what was going on there. In 1963, right after our court case had been decided. See, back in 63, kindergarten was not required for youngsters. So the Unitarian Universalist Church here in Huntsville set up a preschool for the four black children and for a few white children, I don't remember how many, but we all went to kind of a little kindergarten setting. And uh, the whole idea, again, was to let the children be, Black and white children had never gone to school together in the state of Alabama. And that's what they wanted to do, was give them a chance just to have some little kindergarten activities. You know, not serious education, but just the kinds of things that you would do in kindergarten. And uh, I, I am always grateful that they did that. The Unitarians were the only ones who supported the civil rights movement as a church. We had in, individuals from other denominations that supported it, but as a church, the Unitarians really put some skin on it. And there were some Unitarians that came here mostly from the North and were actually killed in the Civil Rights Movement because they were assisting with the Civil Rights Movement. So I will always be grateful to the Unitarians for that. My parents protected me from a lot of the ugliness and potential ugliness that there could have been. And at the same time, they let me know that uh, what I was doing was important. And I knew that I was representing more than just myself when I started Fifth Avenue School, more than just my family even. I understood that uh, you know things had to go well and I couldn't get into a fight every time somebody called me an ugly name or something like that. So. Uh, but I, I think my parents did an excellent job of protecting me and yet preparing me for something, uh, for, for being the first black child to integrate the schools in the state. My father was very proud to have gone to Council High, of course, and as a result of school desegregation, Council High closed, I believe in 1969 or so, 68 or 69. And, uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm not happy about that, but I'm happy that, that we were able to do that. We were able to uh, merge all students into the, the integrated schools rather than having black schools and white schools. But I have a soft spot in my heart for Council High and, and um, uh, how it helped to form, uh, mold my father into the man that he became. Well, home life was, was I think, pretty much like anybody else's. We were kind of upper middle class, I guess. So, you know, we, we had pretty much everything we wanted as, as children. But uh, one of the things I remember was at Fifth Avenue, they had Cub Scouts. 
And one day they passed out these forms uh, for, uh, to take home and have our parents fill them out and sign them. And I, I did that and took the form back to school. A few days later, my father got a call from the Cub Scout master. Now remember, Fifth Avenue, I had integrated Fifth Avenue. But the, the Cub Scout master told my father, he said, uh, Dr. Herford, your son can't join the Cub Scouts here, and I need you to explain to him why. And my father said, well, I don't think I can explain that. But my father said, I will bring him to your office anytime you want, and you can explain it to him. And rather than take my father up on that offer, they disbanded the Cub Scouts at Fifth Avenue. So for at least a few years, we didn't have Cub Scouts at Fifth Avenue. So that was one of the community things, you know, one of the things that I encountered you know, in, in the community. Now, I played football and baseball at Fifth Avenue, and I was the star of the teams, you know. But, um, but as far as Cub Scouts, I, and I never did become a Cub Scout or a Boy Scout after that, after that experience. So that was one of the, that was the way, it, it took a long time for things to change, even to get, you know, to make progress toward where we are today. It took, things, things didn't just happen. And you know, uh, 1963 was nine years after Brown versus Board of Education. So we shouldn't have even had to go through all that. Nine years after, but just because a federal decision had been made in Topeka, Kansas, uh, that didn't mean that Huntsville, Alabama was going to immediately change everything, or the state of Alabama, or the South, or any place. They didn't immediately, it took brave people, courageous people, organized people, to challenge the things that were going on to, to help things to change. I know that we've made a lot of progress from those days back in the 60s. And I understand that there are, I believe it's called green factors, the things that have to be met before we will not be under uh, federal oversight. And I'm sure that progress is being made. I, I don't know all the details about that, but I'm sure that progress is being made. And I look forward to the day when Huntsville will be judged not to be running a dual school system. And uh, we won't have to worry about that anymore. My family is, is just so proud. And I remember at the uh, groundbreaking, uh, my father stood up and he got a chance to speak. And um, he said, other than the day I was married and the birth of my children, this is the proudest day of my life. And I'm sure he just said that first part because he had to, you know, <laughs> because our whole family is, is very, very proud to have such a beautiful modern school uh, with the Hereford name on it. When the school first opened, I was able to do some tutoring programs. I got some friends together, co-workers, and we had a tutoring program. And then, of course, with COVID, we weren't, weren't allowed to do that. But I've already talked to the principal. I was here a few days ago to meet the principal, actually. And we're hoping to do some more things like that in the future. Uh, it, it's not as easy as just signing up and coming in. You have to make arrangements, and there have to be uh, teachers along with the tutors and that sort of thing. But we, we plan to, to do that because we want to do everything we can to ensure the success of the school. Whatever little bit we can contribute, that's what we want to do. I hope that uh, children, especially minority children, have had an opportunity to have the same advantages that white children had. When I was in school, um, white children had the best schools, the best facilities, and so on. And I hope that we are moving toward, I know that we are making progress, but I hope we get to the point where all children have the same opportunities and excellent faculties and excellent facilities. Uh, when Dr. King was here in 1962, one of the things he emphasized was getting the schools integrated. And I think the reason, without him saying this ex explicitly, I think he knew that if we could get children together at a young age, they would see that people are just people, children are just children. Rather than trying to mix them in high school or mix them as young adults, you know, where a lot of biases have been formed, you know. So I hope that, uh, I hope that over these 60 years we've made tremendous progress at uh, children going to school together and seeing that children are children. In 2013, that was the uh, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. And uh, uh, 2013, Congressman Lewis and I were invited to Washington, D.C. We, we were the only two panelists on a discussion of race relations then and now. And I think just about everybody knows his story. But, and at that time, Congressman Lewis was the well, he he's, was the youngest speaker at the March on Washington and at, at that time was the only surviving speaker. And of course, we lost him a few months ago. But uh, that's definitely one of the, the highlights of my life. 
Get involved. Get involved in education. Um, get involved with voting and voter registration because that was one of the other things that Dr. King said when he was here. We had to get people registered to vote. Back then, it was a lot more difficult for minorities to register to vote. There were all kinds of laws, all kinds of obstacles, but uh, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to get people to vote, not, not to lose hope, but to, to vote and uh, be able to bring about the kinds of changes that we need. I think it all starts on an individual level. I think you have to make up your mind that you're going to do better and you're going to be better. And then you organize with your friends, with your neighbors and so forth, and you, you uh, take actions. Again, register to vote. Get people into office that will help to make things better than they were. Um, I, I think that's, that's what we need to do. Um, I plan to get more involved with the Huntsville City School System. In fact, uh, right before COVID, I had met with Chris Steve Finley, the superintendent, I think at that time she had been on the job uh, less than a year or so, or about a year or so. And I plan to meet with her because I hear things out in the community that uh, people's opinions about things that need to change in the school system. And I hear things, and I don't think that the school board members necessarily hear the same, same things that I do. And so I feel like I can kind of be a bridge between some of the people who are dissatisfied with things and with the people who can make things happen and help things to change. So I hope to get involved again and, uh, and work with my uh, school board members and, and probably the, some city council members as well. We're already doing some things with the city council members to, uh, for instance, we're working on a uh, Black History Museum for here in Huntsville. I've gone to about four meetings for that. So we're, we're trying to do some things, but I hope to do more. I think that because of school desegregation, I was able to get a better education growing up from first grade all the way through high school, and it helped to prepare me better for a place like Notre Dame that was very competitive. At the time I applied, I think only 25% of applicants were getting into Notre Dame, and it's probably similar to that now. It may be uh, even more selective now, I'm not sure. But I definitely feel like the fact that I was able to go to better schools with better facilities, uh, I think that helped to prepare prepare me, help, help me to be able to compete with some of those kids that had gone to private high schools in the north, very exclusive, expensive places, you know. And, and I, I still had a little ground to make up, but I, but I would have been further behind had we not had the opportunities that, that desegregation afforded. You know, I, I think my father felt like uh, he suffered some backlash from his activities. Um, and, and I have no doubt that that's true because there were certainly some people, I'm sure there are some people today that aren't happy about what we did almost 60, 60 years ago. But I have to say, um, I, I don't feel like I have encountered very much of that in my personal life. <laughs> about Sonny, well, let's see, I'm a hockey player. I lost this tooth playing hockey at Notre Dame. <laughs> the one time I played without my mouth guard. <laughs> so, and with the back surgery, I don't know if I'll be playing hockey much anymore, honestly, you know, hoping just to be able to ride my bike and stay in shape that way. But, uh, you know, I love music. Um, like I said, I, I do plan to get involved in, uh, in the Huntsville education a lot more than I have been, and I have been some. And my daughter, Catherine, has been some as well. But I, I hope to do a lot more with that. I, I guess I guess that's about it. Music, bicycling, you know, ice skating. <laughs>